Uh, not a lot from me, because I'm not the reason you're here. Um, so I said to the Astronomer Royal, how would you like me to introduce you? And like all great men, he said without real ceremony, uh, call me Martin Rees. Ladies and gentlemen, Martin Rees. Right. Um, thank you very much. It's a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, and I have to start off by saying that I am an astronomer, not an astrologer. That's important because a few years ago I met a well-known Indian tycoon. He knew I had the title Astronomer Royal, and he asked, do you do the Queen's horoscopes? <laughs> and I responded with a straight face, well, if she wanted one, I'm the person she'd ask. He then seemed eager to hear my predictions. I told him that stocks would fluctuate, there'd be trouble in the Middle East and other sort of insightful and surprising things. He paid rapt attention to these insights, but I then came clean. I said I was just an astronomer. He then lost all interest in my predictions. And rightly so, because scientists are rotten forecasters, almost as bad as economists. But. Despite all that, I am going to make a few forecasts about the coming decades, um, but uh, uh, mindful of that, um, I do this very tentatively. Astronomers think in billions of years, but even in that perspective, this century is special. The Earth's existed for 45 million centuries, humans for a few thousand centuries, technology for a few tens of centuries. But this century is the first when one species, ours, is so empowered that the planet's future is in its hands. We're deep in an era that's called the Anthropocene. We have huge powers for good, but we could irreversibly degrade the biosphere, or misdirected technology, bio or cyber, could cause a catastrophic setback to civilization. Fourteen years ago, I wrote a book on this theme, which I entitled Our Final Century. I put in a question mark, but the uh, publishers cut that out. And the American publishers then changed the title to Our Final Hour. <laughs> Americans like instant gratification and the reverse. Well, I didn't think we'd wipe ourselves out, but I did think we'd be lucky to avoid devastating setbacks. And we've had one lucky escape already, because at any time in the Cold War, when armament levels escalated beyond all reason, the superpowers could have stumbled towards Armageddon through muddle or miscalculation. Nuclear weapons are based on 20th century science. I'll focus later in my talk on 21st century sciences, bio, cyber, and AI, which offer huge potential benefits but also expose us to novel vulnerabilities. But before that, let's focus on long-term threats that stem not from conscious decisions, but from humanity's ever heavier collective footprint. And here, even with a cloudy crystal ball, there are some things that we can predict. For instance, it's almost certain that by 2050, the world will be more crowded. 50 years ago, world population was about 3 billion people. It's now about 7.4 billion. The growth's been mainly in Asia and Africa, as shown in this rather nice map, where the size of each country is proportional to the amount of growth in population in the last 30 years. Now, population growth is slightly leveling off. The number of births per year worldwide actually peaked a few years ago and it's going down. Nonetheless, world population is forecast to rise to about 9 billion by 2050. That's partly because most people in the developing world are young, they yet have children and they live longer. So the age histogram here um, the one on the left, which is now uh, in Africa, one on the right, Western Europe, and the one on the left, 
we hope is going to become more like the one on the right. So the uh, number of uh, people uh, who will live to middle age will go up. And that's the reason why even if the birth rate stabilizes, the population is going to go up. The main growth is in East Asia, and of course it's there that the world's human and financial resources will become concentrated. We're seeing the end of four centuries of North Atlantic hegemony. And also there's going to be more urbanization. Even by 2030, Lagos, Sao Paulo and Delhi will have populations above 30 million. And to prevent these megacities becoming turbulent dystopias will surely be a major challenge to governance. Population growth seems currently under-discussed. That's partly because doom-laden forecasts in the 1970s by the Club of Rome, Paul Ehrlich and others have proved off the mark. Up till now, food production has more than kept pace. Famines now stem from wars or maldistribution, not overall shortages. And some deem population discussions a taboo subject, tainted by association with eugenics in the 1920s and 30s, with Indira Gandhi's policies in India, and more recently with China's hardline but effective one child policy. Can the Earth carry 9 billion people? I don't think there's any need for gloom or panic on this front. I'm not an expert, but those experts who I've talked to aver that improved agriculture, low-till, water conserving, and perhaps involving GM crops could feed that number by mid-century. The buzz phrase is sustainable intensification. But lifestyle changes are needed. The world couldn't sustain even its present population if everyone lived like Americans do today, using as much energy and eating as much beef. Population trends beyond 2050 are harder to predict, because they'll depend on what people as yet unborn decide about the number and spacing of their children. Enhanced education and empowerment of women, surely a benign priority in its own right, will reduce fertility rates. But the demographic transition, so-called, hasn't yet reached parts of India and sub-Saharan Africa. And we don't know. These graphs here depend on what the mean fertility is after 2050 and a huge spread, as you can see. If families in Africa remain large, then, according to the UN, that continent's population could double again between 2050 and 2100, from 2 billion to 4 billion. That would raise the world's population to 11 billion, and Nigeria alone would then have as big a population as Europe and North America combined. And almost half of the world's children will be in Africa. Well, optimists remind us that each extra mouth brings also two hands and a brain. Nonetheless, the higher the population becomes, the greater will be all pressure on resources, especially if, as we surely hope, the developing world narrows its gap to the developed world in per capita consumption. And how hard it'll be for Africa to escape the poverty trap. So we must surely hope that the global figure declines more than rises after 2050. In other words, we would be happier to be on the lower of those three curves rather than the highest. Moreover, if humanity's collective footprint on nature pushes too hard against what the uh, Swedish ecologist Rockström calls planetary boundaries, we could get so-called ecological shocks which could irreversibly impoverish our biosphere. With rising extinction rates, we'd be, as it were, destroying the book of life before we've read it. Biodiversity is a crucial component of human well-being. We're clearly harmed if fish stocks dwindle to extinction. There are plants in the rainforest whose gene pool might be useful to us. But for many environmentalists, 
preserving the riches of our biosphere, has value in its own right, over and above what it means to us humans. And to quote the great ecologist E.O. Wilson, mass extinction is a sin that future generations will least forgive us for. So the world's getting more crowded. There's pressure on biodiversity. But the second firm prediction, the world will gradually get warmer. Now, in contrast to population issues, climate change is certainly not under-discussed, though it may be under-acted upon. The one thing everyone knows and agrees on is this famous Keeling curve, measurements made in Hawaii over 50 years, showing how the concentration of CO2 in the air is rising, mainly due to the burning of fossil fuels. The seasonal oscillation, incidentally, is because there's more vegetation in the northern and the southern hemisphere. So in the northern hemisphere winter, the CO2 goes up because the trees lose their leaves. Now, the fifth IPCC report presented temperature projections for different assumptions about future rates of fossil fuel use. And here are the, these projections. Now, we don't know what the future use of fossil fuels will be, but even more important, for each such assumption, there's a spread that's based on the bars at the right of the diagram, which is the scientific uncertainty. And the uncertainty stems from the fact that although we know what the effect of CO2 is in enhancing the greenhouse effects, we don't know about the associated changes, the feedback effects, on water vapour, on cloud cover, and things like that. The best evidence is that that gives you an extra factor two or three, but that is uncertain. But despite these uncertainties, the science tells us that under business as usual scenarios, we can't rule out by 2100 really catastrophic warming and tipping points triggering long-term trends like the melting of Greenland's ice cap and severe rises in sea level. Sadly, some people deny all this, but not so many. I think even among those who accept that this threat is real, there is a range of views. And this range of views on how to react to this hazard stem from differences in economics and in ethics. In particular, in how much obligation we should feel towards future generations. Some of you may have read the works of Born Lomberg in the Copenhagen, the Copenhagen Consensus of Economists. And they apply commercial star discounting, as you would in deciding whether to put up an office building or something. And if you do that, then you, in effect, write off anything that happens after 2050. So unsurprisingly, the Copenhagen Consensus economists, they downplay the priority of addressing climate change compared with shorter-term efforts to help the world's poor. But if you care about those who live into the 22nd century and beyond, as people born recently probably will, then, as other economists like Stern and Weizmann argue, you would deem it worth paying an insurance premium now to protect those generations against the worst case scenario. So even those who agree that there's a significant risk of climate catastrophe a century hence will differ in how urgently they advocate action today. Their assessment will depend on expectations of future growth and optimism about technological fixes. But above all, it depends on an ethical issue in optimizing people's life chances, should we discriminate on grounds of date of birth, or should we value a baby's life as much as our own? As to parenthesis, I'd notice that there is one context where policy does apply an essentially zero discount rate, and that's to radioactive waste disposal, where, as you'll know, the depositories are required to prevent leakage for 10,000 years. In the case of Yucca Mountain, a million years. And it's ironic that we have these specifications when we can't plan the rest of energy policy even 30 years ahead. 
Many still hope that our civilization can segue smoothly towards a low carbon future. The pledges that were made at the Paris conference two years ago were a positive step. But even if they were honored, this may not happen fast enough to prevent the CO2 concentrations rising to dangerous levels. Politicians seldom take a long-term view and they won't ga gain much resonance by advocating unwelcome lifestyle changes when the benefits accrue mainly to distant parts of the world decades in the future. But there is one measure to mitigate climate change which genuinely, I think, is a win-win situation. It's that nations should accelerate research and development into all forms of low carbon energy generation. Renewables, fourth generation nuclear, fusion and the rest. And into other technologies where parallel progress is crucial, especially storage. Batteries, compressed air, pumped storage, flywheels, etc. And smart grids. And that's why an encouraging outcome of Paris was an initiative called Mission Innovation endorsed by more than 20 nations, which was a campaign to double publicly funded R&D into clean energy by 2020. And there was a parallel pledge by Bill Gates and some private philanthropists. This target is actually a modest one, because presently only 2% of publicly funded R&D is devoted to the energy challenge. Why shouldn't this percentage be comparable to spending on medical or defense research? the scope for it to rise a lot. And that's important because the faster these clean energy technologies are researched, the faster they'll advance and the sooner will their prices fall so that they become affordable to developing countries where more generating capacity will be needed and where the health of the poorest hundreds of millions is jeopardized in India, for instance, by smoky stoves burning wood or dung and where there will otherwise be pressure to build coal-fired power stations. You've got to bring down the cost of renewables so that they can leapfrog directly to clean energy. And it would be hard to think of a more inspiring challenge for young engineers than devising clean energy systems which are effective and economical for the entire world. But if this fails, and if it's clear 20 years from now, that our climate seems heading into dangerous territory, there may be pressure for panic measures, a plan B. This would involve being fatalistic about continuing dependence on fossil fuels, but combating its effects by either a massive investment in carbon capture and storage, or else by geoengineering. As we got geoengineering, it's feasible, for instance, to inject enough aerosols into the stratosphere to cool the world's climate. Indeed, what's scary is this might be within the resources of a single nation, even a single corporation. But there could be unintended side effects. Moreover, the warming will return with a vengeance if these countermeasures were ever discontinued. And other consequences of rising CO2 especially the deleterious effect of ocean acidification, would be unchecked. Geoengineering would be a political nightmare. Not all countries would want to turn down the thermostat the same way. And very elaborate climate modelling would be needed in order to calculate the regional impacts of any artificial intervention. In fact, the only beneficiaries would be lawyers because they would have a real bonanza if nations could litigate over bad weather. <laughs> Nonetheless, I think it's prudent to explore geoengineering techniques enough to clarify which options make sense and perhaps even damp down undue optimism about a technical quick fix. Incidentally, um, what I've talked about is the need for better engineering and I am aware that I'm myself an academic scientist, and many of the people here are engineers, um, and I want to make a, uh, a remark, uh, which I know engineers like to hear, uh, and it's linked to uh, one of my favorite cartoons, one of the engineers' favorite cartoons, which shows um, uh, um, two beavers 
looking up at a big hydroelectric dam. One beaver says to the other, I didn't actually build it, but it's based on my idea. <laughs> and that, in many cases, reflects the balance of intellectual effort between the academics and those who actually build things. And I like to tell my colleagues in theoretical physics that the Swedish engineer who invented a zip fastener made a bigger intellectual leap than most of them ever will. <laughs> so that's my uh, uh, modesty injected into this lecture. I think we should be evangelists for new technology and engineering. Without them, the world can't provide food and sustainable energy for an expanding and more demanding population. But we do need wisely directed technology. Advanced renewables are wise goals, so is better agriculture, but geoengineering probably isn't. But what about the other technologies that pervade our lives? Can we cope with their headlong advances? We're getting more vulnerable. Our increasingly interconnected world depends on elaborate networks, as everyone here knows better than me. Electric power grids, air traffic control, international finance, globally dispersed manufacturing, and so forth. And unless these networks are highly resilient, their benefits can be outweighed by catastrophic, albeit rare, breakdowns. Our cities will be paralyzed without electric power, air travel can spread a pandemic worldwide within days, and social media can spread panic and rumor and economic contagion literally at the speed of light. <coughs> Advances in microbiology, diagnostics, vaccines, and antibiotics, they offer prospects of containing pandemics, and that's very good. But the same research does have controversial aspects. For instance, in 2012, two research groups, one in Wisconsin, one in Holland, showed it was surprisingly easy to make the influenza virus both more virulent and more transmissible. To some, this was a scary portent of things to come, to the extent that the American federal government decided in 2014 to stop funding these so-called gain-of-function experiments. Those doing them justified their work saying, to design vaccines, you want to stay one step ahead of natural mutations. But there are downsides, of course. And the new so-called CRISPR-Cas9 techniques for gene editing, that's hugely promising. But of course, there are already ethical concerns raised by Chinese experiments on human embryos. And another controversial possibility is what's called gene drive programs, which can be deployed to make a particular species become sterile. This is, I think, already being applied to the mosquito that carries the Zika virus. And there was talk in the press this week about wiping out all the rats in Scotland use, using this technique. And some people even uh, who are lovers of brown squirrels say we should treat the grey squirrels in this way. It is feasible to do this. But of course, there's a risk if you disrupt an ecology of unintended consequences. They're both prudential and ethical concerns. Back in the early days of recombinant DNA research in the 1970s, leading biologists met in Asilomar, California, and they agreed guidelines on what experiments should and shouldn't be done. That was a seemingly encouraging precedent and has motivated several meetings recently to discuss new developments in the same spirit. But today, 40 years after Asilomar, the research community is far larger, far more broadly international, and far more subject to commercial pressures. And the techniques are far more powerful and scary. And I worry that whatever regulations are imposed on prudential or ethical grounds can't be enforced worldwide any more than the drug laws can or the tax laws can. So I worry that whatever can be done will be done by someone somewhere. And that's a nightmare. Because whereas an atomic bomb can't be built without large-scale special purpose facilities, biotech involves small-scale dual-use equipment, 
Indeed, biohacking is burgeoning even as a hobby and a student sport. And we know all too well that technical expertise doesn't guarantee balanced rationality. The global village will have its village idiots and they'll have global range. <laughs> the rising empowerment of tech-savvy groups or even individuals empowered by bio as well as cyber technology will pose an intractable challenge to governments, all governments, and aggravate, I think, the tension between freedom, privacy and security. I see no way out of that. Concerns about bio-air and bioterror are fairly near term within the next 10 or 15 years. But what about 2050 and beyond? Here, a much more cloudy crystal ball, of course. And we should remember that the smartphone, the web and their ancillaries, already crucial to our network lives, would have seen magic even 20 years ago. So looking several decades ahead, we must keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to transformative innovations that might now seem science fiction. On the bio front, the great physicist Freeman Dyson conjectures a time when children will be able to design and create new organisms just as routinely as his generation played with chemistry sets. Well, if it becomes possible to, as it were, play God on a kitchen table, our ecology and even our species may not long survive unscathed. So let's have, hope that's today's science fiction. But what about another transformative technology? Robotics and artificial intelligence, AI. As I'm sure everyone knows, there have been exciting advances in what's called generalized machine learning. The company DeepMind last year achieved a remarkable feat. Its computer beat the world champion in the game of Go a game that's played intensively in East Asia. And Carnegie Mellon University has developed a machine that can bluff and calculate as well as the best human players of poker. Now, at first sight, you think this may not be such a big deal because it's 20 years since IBM's Deep Blue beat Kasparov, the world chess champion. But Deep Blue was programmed in detail by expert chess players. In contrast, the machines that play Go and poker gained expertise by just being told the rules, in effect, and playing against themselves and getting better. And after three days, the AlphaGo computer could beat a world champion. And their designers don't themselves know exactly how the machines make decisions and make sometimes seemingly insightful moves. Of course, the speed of computers allows them to succeed by brute force methods to some extent. They're able to uh, uh, play millions of games against themselves in an, every day. Just as computers can now learn to identify dogs, cats and human faces by crunching through millions of images. Not the way babies learn. And they learn to translate by reading millions of pages of, for instance, multilingual European Union documents. They never get bored. But advances are patchy. Robots are still clumsier than a child in moving pieces on a real chessboard. They find it hard even to tie your shoelaces. But sensor technology, speech recognition, information searches and so forth are advancing apace. We've all read discussions about the effect on the job market. Robots won't just take over manual work. Indeed, plumbing and gardening will be among the hardest jobs to automate. But routine legal work, conveyancing and such like, computer coding, medical diagnostics and even surgery will be will become done by robots. And the big social and economic question is this. Will this new machine age be like earlier disruptive technologies, 
the car for instance, and create as many jobs as it destroys? Or is it really different this time? It's clear that the money earned by the robots will generate huge wealth for an elite. But I think to preserve a healthy society, we require massive redistribution to ensure that everyone has at least a living wage. And not, I think, the, uh, uh, the wage for doing nothing, but the best thing is to create and upgrade public service jobs where the human element's crucial and is now overvalued, and where demand is huge, especially carers for young and old, but also things like custodians, gardens and public parks, and so on, that will make our social life better and give people a dignity in their work. But let's now look even further ahead. How human-like will these future robots be? If they can observe and interpret their environment as adeptly as we do, they would truly be perceived as intelligent beings to which or to whom we can relate. And such machines pervade popular culture in movies like Her, Ex Machina and the others. Well, would we then have obligations towards them? We worry if our fellow humans and even some animals can't fulfill their natural potential. So should we then feel guilty if our robots are underemployed or bored? Should we worry about giving them too many EU documents to read? What if a machine developed a mind of its own? Would it stay docile or would it go rogue? If it could infiltrate the internet and the internet of things, it could manipulate the rest of the world. It may have goals utterly orthogonal to human wishes. We even treat humans as an encumbrance. Well, some AI pundits take this seriously, and they think that the field already needs guidelines, just as everyone agrees that biotech does. But others regard these concerns as premature, and that we'll have to go on for a long time worrying less about artificial intelligence than about real stupidity. But be that as it may, it's likely that society will be transformed by autonomous robots, even though the jury's out on whether they'll be idiot savants or display superhuman capabilities. There's disagreement, incidentally, about the route towards human-level intelligence. Some think we should emulate nature and try to reverse engineer the human brain. Others say that's just misguided as trying to design flying machines by copying how birds flap their wings. And philosophers debate whether consciousness is special to the uh, wet organic hardware in humans, apes and dogs, so that robots, even if their intellect seems superhuman, will still be zombies lacking self-awareness in a life. We just don't know. The futurologist Ray Kurzweil he now worked at Google, and he is really gung-ho about this future. He argues that once machines have surpassed human capabilities, they will themselves design and assemble a new generation of even more powerful ones. There'll be an intelligence explosion, what he calls a singularity. And he thinks that humans could transcend biology by merging with computers. In old-style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. Kurzweil is a prominent proponent of this singularity, but he's worried it may not happen in his lifetime. He's in his 60s. He takes 100 pills a day to hope to keep going, but he wants his body frozen in liquid nitrogen until this nirvana is reached. I was once interviewed by a group of these chronic enthusiasts based in California, it was called the Society for the Abolition of Involuntary Death. <laughs> they will freeze your body at some uh, lab in Arizona, so when immortality is on offer, you can be resurrected or your brain downloaded. Well, I told them I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than an Arizona refrigerator. And they derided me as a deathist. Really old-fashioned. <laughs> but I was surprised to find that three academics in this country had gone in for cryonics. Two had paid the full whack, 
the third had taken the cut price option of just wanting his head frozen. <laughs> but I'm very glad they were all from Oxford and not from my university. <laughs> but of course, more seriously, research on ageing is being prioritised. But will the benefits be just incremental? Or is ageing, as Kurzweil thinks, a disease that can be cured? Dramatic life extension would, of course, be a real wild card in population projections with huge social ramifications. But it may happen, of course, along with human enhancement in other forms, with all the ethical issues that involves. Um, now, just a brief digression into a third technology, my special interest, space. This is where robots will surely be transformative. During this century, the whole solar system will be explored by flotillas of miniaturized probes, far more advanced than the robots that the European Space Agency landed on a comet, Rosetta, or the NASA New Horizons probe, which transmitted amazing pictures back from Pluto 10,000 times further away than the moon. These two instruments took 10 years on their journey. And the amazing Cassini, which spent many years orbiting Saturn and close-ups of his moons, that's even more of an antique. It was launched over 20 years ago. 1990s technology. When you think of how smartphones have changed, think how much better we could do today. And better, too, than the Curiosity rover, which is now trundling over the surface of Mars. So later this century, giant robotic fabricators may assemble vast lightweight structures in space. Gossamer thin radio reflectors or solar energy collectors, for instance. Perhaps using raw materials mined from asteroids or from the moon. But what about human spaceflight? Robotic and AI advances are eroding the practical case. Nonetheless, I hope people will follow the robots, though it'll be as risk-seeking adventurers, not for any practical goals, where the robots will do the job just as well. And the most promising developments here are spearheaded by private companies, Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. SpaceX has launched unmanned payloads and docked with the space station, it's recovered and reused the launch rocket's first stage, presaging real cost savings. And these two companies hope soon to offer orbital flights to paying customers. Wealthy adventurers are signing up for a week-long trip round the far side of the moon, voyaging further from Earth than anyone's been before. I'm told they've sold a ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight, so that maybe tells you something. <laughs> But we should surely acclaim these private enterprise efforts in space. They can tolerate higher risks than a Western government could impose on publicly funded civilians and thereby cut costs compared to NASA or the European Space Agency. But they should be promoted as adventures or extreme sports. The phrase space tourism should be avoided. It lulls people into unrealistic confidence. By 2100, courageous pioneers in the mould of, say, Felix Baumgartner, who broke the sound barrier in free fall from a high altitude balloon, or our own Sir Ranulph Fiennes, who uh, dragged a sledge across the Antarctic in winter, people like that may have established bases independent of the Earth, probably on Mars. And Musk himself, now age 46, says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. <laughs> but don't ever expect mass emigration from Earth. Here I disagree with Musk, because nowhere in our solar system offers an environment even as clement as the Antarctic or the top of Everest. It's a dangerous delusion to think that space offers an escape from the Earth's problems. Dealing with climate change on Earth is a doddle compared to terraforming Mars. 
Indeed, space is an inherently hostile environment for humans. For that reason, even though we will, I'm sure, wish to regulate genetic and cyborg technology on Earth, we should surely wish these space pioneers good luck in using all such techniques to adapt to the alien and hostile conditions they'll find out there. They'll be free from te terrestrial regulations and they'll have maximal incentive to adapt themselves. Indeed, these spacefarers may spearhead the post-human era, evolving within a few centuries into a new species. And incidentally, they may download themselves into electronic devices. And if they do that, then those devices won't need an atmosphere, they won't need gravity, they may prefer to zoom off into interstellar space. And of course, an interstellar journey is not a deterrent if you are immortal rather than having a human lifespan. So this is a possible uh, future scenario. Let me expand a bit on this. As an astronomer, I'm sometimes asked, does contemplation of huge expanses of space and time affect your everyday life? Well, having spent much of my life among astronomers, I have to say they're not specially serene. And they fret as much as anyone about what happens next week or tomorrow. But they do bring one special perspective, an awareness of how long the future is. Let me explain. The stupendous time spans of the evolutionary past are now part of common culture, outside fundamentalist circles at any rate. But most people still tend to regard humans as the culmination of the evolutionary tree. And that hardly seems credible to an astronomer. Our sun formed four and a half billion years ago, but it's got six billion more before the fuel runs out. And the expanding universe will continue, perhaps forever. And to quote Woody Allen, eternity is very long, especially towards the end. <laughs> so we are not even at the halfway stage of evolution. It may take decades to develop human-level AI, or it may take centuries. But be it as it may, it's but an instant compared to the cosmic future stretching ahead. So, Although Earth's environment may suit us organics, interstellar space may be the preferred arena where robotic fabricators will have the grander scope for construction and where non-biological brains may develop powers that we can't even imagine. Well, is there life out there already? This is a question I'm most often asked. Or is the galaxy waiting for our post-human progeny? We know there's no way in our solar system that harbors advanced life, but there may be freeze-dried bacteria on the red planet, Mars. There may be creatures swimming under the ice of Saturn, Saturn's moon Enceladus. But if we widen our horizon beyond our solar system, we've learned that most other stars have planets around them, just as the sun has the Earth and the other familiar planets. This is a really important discovery, which makes the night sky much more interesting. Roughly speaking, most stars have uh, planets around them, and one star in six has a planet like the Earth. There's one interesting system discovered just last year, which is a very faint star, which has seven planets orbiting around it. It's a miniature solar system. The stars are 100 times fainter, and these planets are going around their, uh, their years, their orbital periods are just a few days or a couple of weeks. So it's a miniature solar system. We don't know if there's any life out there. And of course, if there is life, uh, then uh, um, what we might detect, and I think we will detect in the next 20 years, is evidence for vegetation or some uh, simple organic materials. Uh, but the quest for intelligent aliens, of course, which is what fascinates people even more, that's a high risk thing. No one believes much chance of that, but nonetheless, it's worth a try. And in fact, uh, I chair a committee uh, for a project funded by Yuri Milner, who's a, um, a, a, a Russian investor based in the US, who is putting $100 million into plans to improve and deepen the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Small risk of success, but better to spend the money that way 
than on a big yacht or a football team, as many of the other oligarchs do. Well, I think I'm just running out of time, but just a few concluding remarks. It's perhaps a good thing I have no time to speculate more. So let me focus back closer to here and now. One lesson I draw from the issues I've raised is that we fret unduly about small risks. Air crashes, carcinogenic food, low radiation doses, but we're in denial about some newly emergent threats, which may seem improbable, but whose consequences could be globally devastating. Some are environmental, others are the potential downsides of new technologies. And that's why some of us in Cambridge have set up a centre for study of extreme risk with a focus on these low probability, high consequence threats, which we feel deserve more expert analysis than they've had to assess which can be dismissed as science fiction and which should be on the risk register and to consider how to enhance resilience against the more credible ones and to warn against technical developments that could run out of control. Even if we reduce these risks by only a tiny percentage, the stakes are so high that we'll have earned our keep. A wise mantra, I think, is that the unfamiliar is not the same as the improbable. The innovations that will drive economic advance, information technology, biotech and nanotech, they can boost the developing as well as the developed world. And we don't want to apply the precautionary principle too strongly because we want these new technologies to help the world and we don't want to forego the benefits if we don't develop them. But on the issue of long-term thinking, I want to conclude with a sort of homily. Something that strikes me whenever I go to Ely Cathedral, which is only about 10 miles from where I live. Those who built it, and who built all Europe's great cathedrals, they thought the world might only last another thousand years. Their horizons were limited, the fens were their world. They knew of nothing beyond Europe. But despite these constricted horizons in both space and time, despite the deprivations and harshness of their lives, despite their primitive technology and meagre resources, they built these huge and glorious buildings they never lived to see finished and that uplift our spirits centuries later. What a contrast that is to much of our discourse today. Unlike our forebears, we know a great deal about our world and indeed about what lies beyond. Technologies our ancestors couldn't conceive enrich our lives and our understanding. Many phenomena still make us fearful, but the advance of science spares us from the rational dread. We know we are stewards of a precious pale blue dot in a vast cosmos, a planet with a future measured in billions of years. So isn't it shameful that our planning horizon is shorter than that of our medieval forebears? My final message is up there. It seems to me that spaceship Earth is hurtling through space. Its passengers are anxious and fractious. Their life support system is vulnerable to disruption and breakdowns. But there's too little planning, too little awareness of long-term risks. And I give the final word to Peter Medawa, a great scientist who gave the Reef Lectures 50 years ago, he said that we should not move from denial to despair, but he says that the uh, uh, world, attitude to the world, is like uh, the attitude in the simile. It's like the bells of our pine cattle. They're attached to our own necks, and if they don't make a melodious sound, it's our fault. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much, Professor Rees. Um, I'm sure there are lots of questions from the deathists in the room. Um, anyone like to start? You're willing to take a few questions, I, I believe. Anyone like to start? Anita. 
Um, as risk professionals, we try and encourage people to think preventatively to prevent incidents from escalating into crises. Mm -hmm. um, but what I find is uh, analyzing crises, it is really very much uh, a question of responding uh, to global events, particularly humanitarian crises, that we see that global cooperation. Do you recognize that as a, a human trait? And will artificial intelligence help us to address that? Um, well, I don't know. I think that, that, that that's a worry. It can obviously, if it's under our control, it can certainly help. I mean, I think the one thing which artificial intelligence is going to help with in the near future is in uh, managing electricity grid systems optimally and city traffic and things like that. And uh, ditto, obviously, in a disaster scenario. Uh, one sociological question, which is a bit related to what you're saying, is um, uh, if there is some disaster in say, a mega city of the developing world in Mumbai or Lagos or something, does the fact that everyone now has mobile phones make it better or worse? Obviously, it means that you can communicate things uh, and advice and news. But on the other hand, it means panic and rumor can spread too. And I think there are debates about whether uh, the um, mobile phone systems we switched off after a pandemic to serious discussion, and rightly so, because that's a social science issue. Steve. <clears throat> Thank you for your lecture. Um, as a scientist from the other university, not Finland Polytechnic, yes. um, I have to ask you what your views are on the current political narrative, which is trying to transform our universities from centers of research and philosophy into becoming centers of um, vocational training. Do we lose something from that, or do we gain? Well, I think um, uh, universities have ad added this extra role, which is important, because 40% uh, um, of people go to universities, um, whereas it was in the time when you and I were there, um, uh, less than 10%. So obviously, um, they are um, harboring people who aren't going to be scholars, etc., but who are um, training for specialised careers. So they've got to do that. But you're quite right in saying that, um, uh, that they mustn't lose their original idea. And um, uh, 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 remind me of an episode when I was asked to give a, a, a speech at a dinner in Oxford for um, professors who had gained big grants for technology. Um, the vice chancellor then asked me. And uh, I made a point which may resonate with you, which was that the two biggest piece of intellectual property to come out of Oxford came from the professor of medieval English and the professor of Anglo-Saxon, namely C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, both of whom made billions of pounds for the so-called creative industries, and both of whom were caricatures of old-style dons who would have hated the modern culture of audit and assessment. And so I really hope that Oxford in particular and Cambridge can preserve uh, the uh, habitat and environment which allowed great figures like that to flourish. I'm going to uh, invoke the chairman's pre uh, privilege here and ask you about biohacking, mm -hmm. which you mentioned, which is a slightly terrifying risk. Mm -hmm. uh, just say a little more about how that might develop. Well, I, I mean, I, I should say I'm not... I'm not an expert, but it is now becoming true, uh, becoming possible uh, to modify um, uh, genomes, and it'll soon be possible um, to, uh, to sequence a genome and to synthesize uh, a, a version where, where, where parts of it are modified. And hack so, into it. Yeah, yeah yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and redes redesign it. Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Um, so I think that this, is, this is going to be possible, and uh, as I say, this is going to have effects um, which could be dangerous if I took it on environment if you uh, make certain species extinct, etc. So I think it's, uh, it, it's worrying that these techniques um, require fairly modest dual-use equipment, mm -hmm. not the kind of equipment you need to make an atomic bomb. Um, and, of course, the technology is going to be widely understood mm -hmm. and uh, widely used for benign purposes as well. So I, I really do think this is something which is going to be very hard to control. Final question. Anyone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Where we go? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, I thought it was fabulous. Um, 
okay, if we're not spending enough time on the big stuff, mm -hmm. um, some of that must be to do with the way that humans are, the way that people think, the way that they operate, the biases and all the rest of it. Now, we're making quite a lot of advances in terms of understanding how people are, what drives them, what motivates them, and how you can influence their thinking. Yes. I just wondered how well you thought these two branches of science are working together, the behavioral guys and um, individuals like yourself. Um, uh, well, I mean, I think the, um, uh, it, among the academic community, they're working together, but you're quite right in saying that, uh, um, uh, I mean, many individuals have urgent personal uh, uh, issues, um, and all governments and politicians have urgent issues. And it's very hard to get them to uh, um, take on board uh, long-term global uh, concerns when they clearly have very many immediate worries that they care about. And uh, they, uh, in fact, Mr. Juncker, uh, one of his wise remarks was that uh, it's easy to um, decide what the right thing is to do, but it's hard to do it and get re-elected. And that, that is a, a serious problem for all, all politicians. Um, I think um, in this context, um, I think the world's religions can help. And I should say that although I'm, uh, I'm not a believer at all, I have been involved with the Papal Academy of Sciences, um, which is a, uh, a body with people from all faiths and none, and which provided some scientific input into the Pope's encyclical um, in 2015, which was very important in helping to generate the consensus at the Paris conference, because uh, uh, it carries huge, he got a standing ovation at the UN, and it carries huge weight in Latin America, um, Africa, and East Asia, albeit not in the American Republican Party, um, but he, uh, he carries huge weight. Um, and um, I think that's an example um, where um, uh, the issue was raised higher on the political agenda because of the influence of religion. And whatever one thinks about the Catholic Church, you can't deny its long-term vision, its global range, and its concern with the world's poor. And uh, the, the reason I think that's important is that if we want to uh, counteract the tendency of politicians to focus on the short-term and the parochial, the only way we can do it is to make sure that the long-term issues are on, the, uh, on their agenda because they're in their inboxes and in the press. And so the more we can do to, to raise public awareness of these, uh, the, the, the more likely it will be the politicians will prioritize um, actions that will uh, minimize these, these long-term threats. And um, of course, um, most movements in the last 50 years, and even before, have started not with politicians, but with public uh, people, charismatic leaders, and then opinion with um, uh, you know, um, anti-slavery, Martin Luther King, Rachel Carson, um, gay rights and uh, all, all, all these things. They've started with individuals and then they've got traction and the politicians take them up. And, uh, um, you know, I think that's why David Attenborough is helping with some of these ecological issues, the oceans and things like that. But we've got to get the public to care. And only when the public cares will the politicians care. Okay. <clears throat> Unless there are any burning questions, I need... To... Yes, just one more and then I need to bring it to a close. Uh... Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just looked at the statistics we give in terms of the forecast uh, as it relates to Africa. Now, again, considering where technology, technology is going. Yes. So from your own experience, how do you think Africa should position so that there will be a balance? Well, I wouldn't, presume, I wouldn't presume to say, but I think uh, what, what one issue which is important is obviously women's education is a good thing in its own right and in many parts of the world that has that along with later marriage in the muslim areas has in itself reduced the fertility rate um uh, whether that will happen in africa we don't know i mean i think the um, um the, the worry that uh, some people have but i can't judge is that uh, um, in some parts of the world there will be a cultural preference for larger families uh, even when people have the choice their fertility. And if that's the case, then that might be bad for the world because, of course, there are negative externalities. I think we'd all agree that um, uh, if the world's population gets too high, um, it's going to put more pressure on resources. And so there, and so there is uh, what uh, economists would call a negative externality um, if people have large families. 
Um, but of course, I, 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 have no, I have no idea. But I, I think uh, uh, I think what's happened in parts of Africa is that I think in um, in Ethiopia, in Addis Ababa, the populations, uh, the, the uh, fertility rate's gone down, but not in the country. And so we we, we don't know how it will go. But I, I think um, uh, the Niger and places like that are projected to have hugely rising populations, and uh, that's going to make it hard for their politicians to deal with what's a difficult situation anyway, I think. But, uh, but again, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert. But Lord Rees, thank you very much indeed. Um, could I ask you to show your appreciation for Lord Rees?